Hello friends and welcome to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for this second Sunday in the Epiphany season. Halfway through January already, who can believe it? Today we gather and hear the story of the wedding at Cana in Galilee, how Jesus transformed ordinary water into wonderful wine, the wine of God's blessing, the wine of the kingdom. And we ask ourselves what Jesus can transform in us today. This week, sadly, we're without Katie, who's not very well, but we shall pray for her and hold her in our thoughts as we gather together yet apart to worship God, to praise his name, and to listen for his call upon our lives. May he richly bless you as he blesses all of us in this worship. And so we begin our worship together with some prayers of penitence. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us confess our sins. God, be gracious to us and bless us, and make your face to shine upon us. Lord, have mercy. May your ways be known on the earth, your saving power among the nations. Christ, have mercy. You, Lord, have made known your salvation and reveal your justice in the sight of the nations. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us and free us from all our sins and bring us to eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shall we pray? Eternal Lord, our beginning and our end, bring us with the whole creation to your glory hidden through past ages and made known in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Bible reading today is taken from John chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they did. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. I love the story of the wedding at Cana in Galilee because it's so earthed in real life. Even at 2,000 years distance, we can understand the importance of a wedding. Maybe we don't always understand how much effort went in to a wedding in the first century in Palestine. The wedding feast would last maybe a week. The whole community of maybe 200 people might be invited but certainly preparations for the wedding would have gone on for years and years and years before ever there was any sign of who the betrothal would be. Every time a family had a daughter, then they would begin almost from the moment of birth, planning and getting ready for the day when she would be given in marriage to her husband. And one of the things that a, a farmer or a, a father of any description would do if they had a plot of land would be to begin laying aside the choice portion of the grape harvest each year to make wine 
ready for that wedding day. And so by the time the wedding came round, there would be vintage wine stored up for maybe a decade or more, ready for the day. And there would be newer wine that had been made just in the years immediately before the wedding. And the custom would be for that very choice wine, the old wine, the vintage wine, to be brought out first at the feast. And so that people could enjoy that. And once they'd had a few, once they'd become a little bit inebriated, then the more inferior wine, the newer wine, would be brought out and the guests would continue drinking that. But what's absolutely not to happen at a wedding feast is for there to stop being wine. Yes, the wine would generally get more and more inferior as time went on, but to run out was a disaster. To run out was almost a sign that the couple, the family, had been tried and found wanting. The wine being a sign of God's blessing as it was, it was important to keep that flowing. If the wine stopped, if it ran out, then it was a sign that maybe God's blessings had run out on that family. Maybe this couple weren't fully and truly blessed for their marriage. There would be a sense of shame on the family. And so, in a way, it was a bit of a risk to have a wedding feast in case the wine might give out and people would store up absolutely loads if they could to make sure that that didn't happen. But on this occasion, it did. And there was a real danger, which Mary spotted and which she asked Jesus to do something about. A real danger that this couple would be embarrassed and that there would be a scandal about how much blessing there was for their wedding. That sense of it being a bit of a risk to throw a feast, to worry whether you have enough for your guests, I suppose is something that's true for all of us. I know when we have people round, I always famously over cater. I always buy far more than we need in terms of drinks, whether they're alcoholic or not. I always produce far too much food, but I have to do that. Otherwise, I worry that suddenly somebody will turn up and say, is there any more? And I have to say, no, we've run out. What a shame and how much shame I would feel. Well, multiply that by a million and you might get somewhere near the situation in the first century at a wedding. But my theory is that actually we don't just feel those things in relation to parties or weddings or feasts. We feel that in a way through all of life and especially when it comes to Christian service and Christian ministry. Many of us worry that we just don't have what it takes, that we just don't have enough to offer to make it worth offering, that we don't quite have enough to make it viable to take the risk and offer what we have in God's service. And because of that worry, we decide not to put ourselves to the test. We decide so often just to hang back, not to get involved, not to put ourselves forward, not to take the risk. And the thing is, if we don't take the risk, if we don't put ourselves out there for God, then we're like a family who decide not to have the feast, not to have the wedding. To sit back and say, no, it would be better just to carry on quietly, living our lives, and not seek to rejoice, not seek to express the blessings of God. We, as it were, keep our wine locked away in case it's ever called upon. We're too worried to uncork the bottle or the barrel. But we don't, in that regard, open ourselves to the possibilities of God's blessing. We don't open ourselves to the possibilities of God's celebration. We don't open ourselves to the joys and the blessing of the feast. I wonder if any of you are old enough or watch the right channels to have ever seen The Waltons, that famous series that came out of America in the 1970s. And in The Waltons there were two characters, two sisters. They were uh, the Baldwin sisters, Mamie and Emily, and they famously made the recipe, a bit of moonshine. But the thing about the Baldwin sisters was 
this hangover of a relationship that had almost happened decades and decades before. I think it was Emily who, during the period of the Civil War, which was about 60 or 70 years before the, the programme was set, during that period, a young man called Ashley Longworth had passed through the community and possibly just for one or two days had paid a bit of court to Miss Emily. Well, she lived her life thinking that one day Ashley Longworth would be coming back for her. Uh, we don't know whether he was killed in the war, whether he found someone else, whether he moved on. We don't really know the story. But Miss Emily lived her life thinking that she had to keep herself ready for the day when Ashley Longworth would come back and they would resume their relationship. And her fear at not being ready for that, her fear at letting him down, meant that in some ways she never really lived her life. She never opened herself up to the possibilities that there might be more for her. Well, that's not what God wants for us. That's not what Jesus wants for us. He doesn't want us to hold ourselves back. He doesn't want us to to avoid any risk that we might be entering into by opening ourselves up to his possibilities. He doesn't want us to keep the cork firmly in our bottle. He wants us rather to have an abundant life. That's what Jesus said, didn't he, in John chapter 10, verse 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus' modus operandi is to take what we have, to treasure it, and to transform it, to transform what we have to his glory. Where we see water, he sees wine. And I wonder what there is in us that Jesus today could take and treasure and transform. Things that we think of as ordinary, things that we think of as not quite enough. Nobody would ever have poured water out for the guests at the wedding. Well, how much do we think what we have is water when God sees that it's wine? Do we, like Mary, say in response to God's call, how on earth can I fulfil this? How on earth can I live up to this? Look at me. What have I got to offer? And yet, like Mary, we need to hear God's reassurance. Do not fear. With God, nothing is impossible. And like Mary, we need to be ready to give our yes. And like Mary, to prompt each other to action, that we might each give our yes. So today, I'm encouraged, and I want to encourage and challenge all of us, to be ready to take the risk with God, to uncork our bottles, whatever we think's in there, and let God change our water into wine. I want to encourage us to have the party, to have the feast, to celebrate the abundant life that God wants us to have, to trust in him, not to fear. I want to encourage us, as God's church, to let God make us into the wine of the kingdom, so that life might taste good for all, and that we all may be blessed as we feast with him. Amen. Our intercessions come from Times and Seasons, the Church of England Common Worship Volume. We pray for the coming of God's kingdom. You sent your Son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your Spirit. Rouse us to work in his name. Father, by your Spirit, Bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Father, by your Spirit, 
bring in your kingdom. Father, use us, unworthy as we are, to bring in your kingdom of mercy, justice, love, and peace. Empower us by your Spirit, and unite us in your Son, that all our joy and delight may be to serve you, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we ask for God's blessing on ourselves, on those whom we love, and on those who need his help in any particular way. Christ our King, make you faithful and strong to live in his love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go with you and stay with you always. Amen.